Good morning, everybody. Again, we are talking about, let's say, the sustainability uh, sessions during the METS. Last year, we started with uh, the first time with the biofouling uh, conference, and that was a real success, I have to admit. So we uh, will continue this year. We have a new approach. The new approach is that we are doing it virtual. Uh, that's more difficult than in the last year when you have um, physical meetings. Um, one of the things where we were uh, discussing last year was the biofouling within the sustainability and the biofouling is related to one of the main topics and the main issues in our industry. We noticed last year that uh, biofouling is also a cause of uh, increasing of in species in uh, not only in Europe, but worldwide. Talking about Europe, last year we mentioned that we had 20,000 invasive species in, um, in Europe and 40,000 are non-native. And that is the main cause of the loss of biodiversity. What I did, uh, noticed uh, during one year is that the competent authorities, the governmental authorities are starting to realize that uh, the increasing of uh, invasive species has, an, let's say, an increase of loss of biodiversity. And that is a real a main issue. For that respect, we are, uh, let's say, working all together within the different industries and the governmental authorities to reduce invasive species and to reduce, let's say, the loss of biodiversity and to make it sure that uh, nature is... Uh, Recovering. Um, what I like to do is uh, keep it, uh, my introduction as uh, small as possible. And uh, I like to give, let's say, the first uh, overview of what is happening and what is uh, worldwide on a global uh, basis. And I like to give the word to uh, Julian Hunter uh, so he can inform us uh, in general words. What is the situation now and what is the issue? Thank you, Albert. Good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, uh, the, the IMO guidance on biofouling management recognizes the importance of effective anti-fouling systems to prevent uh, fouling. And it, it recognizes within the guidance the importance of anti-fouling coatings, biocide anti coatings, as a critical tool necessary to prevent fouling of uh, all ships, including commercial ships and also pleasure craft. Not only does the guidance talk about the importance of products, but it talks about the importance of applying them properly, specifying them well, and all the right ways of uh, dealing with them in service to make sure that they're done in an environmentally safe way. And this is a critical part of protecting uh, global biodiversity and preventing translocation of invasive species. Biocidal anti-foulings are very different now to what they were five years ago. And, the, and what's driven that is actually regulation. And the industry has supported and gone along with regulation and, and still supports good regulation. They're in the European Union, we have the biocidal product regulation, which has driven a harmonized and stricter approach to uh, regulation and approval of biocidal anti-fouling things. So for example, now I think there are four biocides that the paint industry can use in, in anti-fouling paints. When before, five years ago, it was 14 plus. So the numbers of products, is, uh, numbers of biocides that can be used is significantly reduced. And that's on the basis of wanting to use on the regulations driving the use of, more, of less harmful materials, materials that wants to get out into the environment, biodegrade and don't build up in, 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 uh, in the environment. Every product before it's approved has to go through an environmental risk assessment. This means it has to be determined whether it's safe or not, and not only to the environment, but also to humans. And there's this clear methodology that's been published by the commission on how to do that. And the industries work very closely with, with the commission on that. So the paint companies have been working flat out for the past five, six, 10 years to develop products to meet the new criteria and many new technologies have been brought in, the products that you'll see on, on the shelves now, the products which are going forward uh, for approval under the biocidal product regulation. So at the moment we have 
Uh, all the products in uh, biocidal products in Europe are under review by, it, it, by under the European process by the member states who are talking closely with each other on how to do that. Now, the criteria for approval were set in 2017 and the paint manufacturers worked hard to make sure that those criteria could be met and submitted products for approval. What we've seen, however, in the, in the past year or so is the commission actually have actually changed the, uh, the game. They've introduced some new rules, uh, which are, it's basically a new way of doing environmental risk assessment by putting in some new environmental models for how uh, products are looked at from, environment, from an environmental perspective. And what we're seeing is, you know, if you want to approve an anti-fouling paint and carrots environmental risk assessment, you have to determine the concentration of biocide that would be present in the environment, whether it be in the marina or outside the marina or beyond. And what we're seeing is the models that they're using are unproven. So we're in a situation where uh, the paint industry's products are being evaluated against use in marinas, which, which are, have a, a, a unrealistic number of boats in them. In fact, some of the, 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 mod, the, the boats in the models, um, if you had to get that many boats in the marinas, you'd have to have boats stacked on top of each other. So there's obviously a bit of a problem. These, these uh, models are not validated. So what we're saying in the industry is let's sit around the table and uh, think about a, a realistic way of, of modeling um, uh, biocidal anti-foulings uh, in, in, in a more realistic way, which uh, is uh, something which allows more effective products to remain on the market. And so we can continue to protect uh, the environment for, from biodiversity. I mean, biodiversity is a key issue. There's an EU uh, regulation uh, and, and strategy on, on, on biodiversity. Um, and obviously in times of global warming where ecosystems are already pressured with increased temperatures, we really have to stay on top of, uh, uh, of making sure that vessels are not uh, going around Europe or fouled, um, acting as little taxis for invasive species around between the different. Uh, okay. And can you also address a little bit uh, for timing um, the difficulty within the BPR? Is the BPR, let's say, in Europe uh, in compliance with other European rules? Well, this is, this is the, the issue. You know, the, what we tend to see is because the biocidal product regulation is governed by one part of the commission and the biodiversity directive is, 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 is governed by another part of the commission, the two don't always uh, match. So we're in a situation now, potentially if these models are used forward and we don't have effective anti-fouling products on the market, that uh, the mass fouling of boats uh, in Europe could result in uh, one directive, i.e. the biocidal product directive, causing a problem for biodiversity, which is a different type of, uh, different type of directive in, in a different part of the commission. So yeah, there's a need obviously for the commission, the, uh, the different departments and the different issues to come together and think of a more holistic approach where all aspects of environmental protection are considered, not just the amount of small amount of biocide in water that there may be, but also the impact on biodiversity if we don't have effective products. Okay. Thank you, Jürgen. Gerrit, um, you're the chairman of, let's say, the EPIC anti-fouling uh, uh, committee. Um, I'd like to ask you, what are the developments within the paint manufacturers about, let's say, the different kind of uh, anti foundings but of different kind of coatings, uh, maybe non biocidal uh, coatings? Mm -hmm. And secondly, also, what is the global um, uh, view of EPIC on this uh, particular topic? Thank you, Robert. I think uh, we're certainly very busy at the moment. Julian's just laid out the sort of framework that we're operating under. We, we've, as a coatings organization, we, we've been waiting 15 years for the BPR to actually finally come through to approving products. So we're following the discussions very closely about what the risk assessments look like and what the policies are around allowing products to be placed on the market. Out the back of that, over the past five, 10 years, companies have been designing their products around those policy decisions and those risk assessment frameworks so that we can uh, make sure that the products we place on the market are safe to use, but crucially also efficacious. What we see now is a lot more uncertainty around that. So the, the BPR rules seem to be changing as we are negotiating the process. And so companies are now starting to look at alternative ways to control fouling from a coating perspective. 
it's true to say that we are still heavily dependent on biocidal based systems. But as Julian's pointed out, those systems have changed over the past 10 to uh, 15 years. And in the past five years, there's been a very big shift into reducing the amount of biocides within the system. So chemical companies have become smarter uh, and coatings companies have become smarter at the way that those biocides are deployed. So we're using different resin technologies that control the release. We're seeing some really good progress from uh, biocide suppliers in terms of using encapsulation or co-formulants with other compounds to control the release and mitigate against some of the, the hazards that are uh, linked to these substances so that we can really formulate good efficient products with the minimum impact from a human exposure point of view and environmental risk point of view. But I think now we're very much moving toward this situation where I've spoken in the past about how all the different legislations overlap together. So we've got chemical policy, we've got environmental emission policy and now we've got the biodiversity agenda as well and what I, I'm starting to see now is a very big need to find the middle space about how we address each of the issues in, the, in that policy framework so that we can solve each of the objectives in those different regulatory frameworks by selecting solutions that can make sure that um, hulls remain unfouled. The big game changer for this in Europe particularly is going to be the European Green Deal because that really is starting to look much more closely at the chemical policy, about sustainable use of chemicals, about the biodiversity impacts that a chemical industry has on in the just in more general terms and also concepts around circularity. So companies now are starting to look toward what that means from a formulator point of view and how that will affect our ability to use raw materials in our, in our products. So obviously, we're now hunting around making sure that we can provide products that add value to the assets we protect, protect against um, uh, fouling and prevent uh, growth, marine growth, but also ways that we can also find lower impact solutions where it makes sense to do so. So that's where we're seeing more deployment of biocide free products. We're starting to see more cleaning systems coming in, particularly in the uh, marine uh, area where the large vessels are being cleaned. But there are also some really smart startup companies now that are looking at cleaning devices for, for yachts, so in situ within marinas and things like that. And that's receiving some interest from coating companies and investment in providing products that can work hand in hand with these novel solutions, rather than trying to push a one size fits all uh, agenda all of the time. So which is kind of reflecting on my points from last year is that that direction, trying to find a balance of thing, more sort of holistic whole management, if you like, is going to get stronger in the future as we move forward. And companies are aware of that and are starting to think about how you manage that uh, for the, the short and medium term. That's not easy though, because the regulations seem to be changing around us. And that's what Julian alluded yeah. to. The risk assessment is key for us to make sensible judgments about what we formulate with and how we take that forward. It doesn't really matter what now, whether you're making an anti-fouling paint or whether you're making a film or whether you're making some other device, if you rely on chemistry to achieve the creation of that solution, everybody now has to be very mindful of what's happening from the, the policy frameworks around sustainability and, and biodiversity. Okay. Um... I uh, would like uh, first to give the word uh, to Dan, and then uh, later on I come back to you with some questions about, let's say, what's happening in uh, different areas in Europe, not only in Europe, but worldwide. And that has a relation to the chemical strategy as well. So, um, Dan, can you give us an update on, the, let's say, the clofouling project of IMO? And also, what is the difference between last year and this year? Okay, good morning, Albert. Um, so in respect of the IMO glow fouling project, it's still uh, still underway. Um, in terms of the recreational, so, the, so the, just for context, the glow fouling project um, encompasses shipping um, and other structures, and we're kind of focused on the uh, recreational marine aspect of it. Um, that's still, still going ahead. Um, there's going to be a survey which, is, which has been launched and is still live now, which I'd encourage people to, um, to look at. 
Um, that's asking about um, people's habits in relation to um, anti-fouling and uh, use of boats and marinas, etc. Uh, and that's going to help shape some of the work um, that we do in the future. <clears throat> also, um, there's a scope of work that's been put together. So uh, um, IMO are appointing a consultant to specifically focus on best practices um, and looking at the landscape and um, what's happening internationally currently. Um, in terms of world sailing, we've been um, working on a number of educational resources, um, part of which focuses on um, the, the issue of invasive species. We've translated that into 14 languages and our, our national federations are using those uh, across the world as we speak. So that's what we've been working on in the last year. There's also um, a couple of organizations. So ICOMIA, the International Uni um, Union of Conservation for Nature, um, World Sailing and IMO, all looking to, uh, to partner to uh, create some additional resources specifically to uh, echo some of the work about best practice, um, focusing initially on the, the 12 target countries that have been identified as the globe, as part of the globe fouling scheme, um, but then also to uh, to share that with the rest of our membership. Okay. Um, can you also explain to everybody that it's not only, let's say, uh, let the best practice is not only focusing on, let's say, cleaning and uh, applying anti foulings or removing anti foulings but also to other solutions? Yeah, it's a mixture. So um, it's even in where you have marine infrastructure, for example. So recreational boating, we still obviously have marine structures um, such as pontoons and cleans. Um, also, yeah, as you, as you mentioned, it's not just about anti-fouling, it's all the different technologies available. So part of it is the kind of the uh, technological solutions, but also a really important aspect is also the education. So the education of, I, for, for us, it's uh, boaters or the other um, industries that are involved. Thank you. Sorry, thank you. Uh, I was on mute. Um, Darren, can you give us an update? Uh, last year, we received, an, let's say, an overview of what uh, Sony has done and uh, what, what are all kinds of um, uh, applications you uh, uh, practice and what kind of uh, experience you had. Is there any updates on this particular moment? It's, uh, let's say, is the device improved or did you had other kind of experience and so, so sorry about so so um so, sonny holds view certainly over the last year is um we've seen a real uh, adoption of novel technologies even though it's 50 year old technology uh, and our company's 13 years old these novel technologies in commercial shipping huge huge uptake and huge interest um, and I, I, I'm now chairing uh, the GIA's, uh, the uh, Globe Fouling GIA, uh, Global Industry Alliance, and, and it is currently being driven by commercial shipping. So, um, frankly, most of the studies that go on, as I always put it, are purchase orders. We keep getting repeat and repeat and repeat orders. But I keep saying that the novel technologies that are coming out, uh, particularly in commercial shipping, are not a silver bullet to buy, uh, to buy a fouling. This has to be a joined up approach. It has to be a joined up approach with the coating companies, novel technologies such as ultrasonics and, uh, and, and, uh, and wraps, all these kind of things, and the cleaning companies, but also the marinas and the regulators. Uh, and that's kind of where we're coming from as Sonihull, um, working with the uh, Globe Fouling Projects from the GIA. What is this joined up approach? Because otherwise what we're gonna see is we're gonna see regulation go one way, technology go another way, uh, the buying habits of the market go another way and it will end up being a right mess. Uh, particularly if you look at, uh, and we've already mentioned, there's a, there's a sort of difference between regulation around uh, chemicals and one around um, the sort of bi marine biology and, and how they mix it. Well, if you then take in the unilateral uh, regulation that's going on around the world, um, you know, we can talk about Europe. You look at the US, different states are adopting different regulations. Um, and, and we're seeing that through commercial shipping firstly, but that will then affect how uh, companies like ours can operate, how um, the coatings companies can operate, because you can't make 200 different sorts of coatings for 200 different lots of regulations. It's not economically viable. So there's a huge issue that we need to grab. This is a complex issue. 
that just needs people to work together and cooperate. There is no silver bullet. Nobody is going to lose out if we work together. So that's kind of the message we're getting out. And the other message we're working on Sonny Hill is there are very few environmental issues where if you do the right thing, not only will you save the environment, you will save an absolute fortune. A clean vessel uses far less fuel which is great for CO2. A clean vessel performs better. So if you're into sailing, you want performance, you want that. And your maintenance bill will be much lower if you maintain it to be clean. So there are very few opportunities in the green world where you're saying, actually, this is cheaper to get it right, not more expensive. And so that's where the focus is for Sonny Hull, is trying to get out that economic message that this is good for your pocket, um, because actually then it will be good for the oceans. And that's what we're trying to do. In fact, you're saying that you are working together with, let's say, with the, with the chemical industry, in this case, with the, the, the paint manufacturers. You need, uh, let's say, a kind of coating. And then uh, Sony, and in this case, uh, Ultra Sonor in general, is possible. Is Absolutely. The so the, 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 the way forward, in, in my view, in Sony Hall's view, is certainly that, uh, although Sony Hall's a bit of a misnomer, it's got the word hull in there. Most of our focus is on niche areas, on, on propulsion, propellers, on um, cooling systems, all the areas that are really hard to clean and also um, where the coatings aren't necessarily um, as beneficial. And, and, and the coatings companies, I'll tell you what, hats off to them. They have done a remarkable job. They, they employ some geniuses in the chemistry there to keep pace with regulation where it's going and to keep pace with a world where we don't want to be leaching biocides in. They're doing a great job, but they cannot do it alone. And also Sonnyhall cannot do it alone. It's not economical to cover an entire hull of a larger vessel uh, in ultrasonics at the moment. It's certainly not economical on retrofit. On some of the smaller vessels, certain recreational vessels, absolutely. And guess what? You still need to put a coating on there. So we need to find what's the right coating that accentuates the ultrasonics and the ultrasonics accentuates the benefit of that coating. And then there are other, there's the wraps, there's all sorts of new technologies coming out. One of the biggest problems is um, people don't understand this. We just did a survey, I think we went out to about four and a half thousand people in recreational boating. And 70% um, of them said, said that they never heard of ultrasonics for biofouling. So there's a huge, there's a huge piece of work to be done to get people to understand the, the, the technologies out there and how they work together. Yeah. And in order to do that, the, the, the supply chain, those suppliers of those technologies, be they coatings, ultrasonics, whatever, need to work together to get the message out. We can actually have a major impact on biofouling if we work together. If we work unilaterally, we will not have a major impact and it will actually be no good for the industry. It will certainly be no good for boating and it will be no good for our environment. Thank you. I think that's um, very wise uh, advice. Is there, to your opinion, any possibility for the, for the near future that not only, let's say, biocidal free, but also for the biocidal anti there will be still um, a place for it? Absolutely. I think we're we're moving into a transition period. So I think in this first phase with biocidal approval, whatever the reg regulations look like, there's a like I'm certain that you'll still see biocidal products approved for use in this next phase. And then going forward, the biocides themselves will be up for reevaluation in the next three to four years. So so again, you'll see some more scrutiny. But I think we're in transition. So you'll start to see a different maybe product offer across the, the ranges that you see with a different balance of products. So products targeted to different regions or particular water bodies rather than just a one size fits all approach, which is, has been the way uh, in the past where you can buy a single product and use that whether you're in the Baltic or the Mediterranean. So that will definitely shift. But I, but I think the other side of this is that the, the key thing with that transition, and, and this is why Dan's work is important, is about the cultural change, the education side of things. What we see as being very difficult, even when you find really good alternative products, biocidal or otherwise, convincing yachting people to convert to something new is really hard because everybody's an expert. So they never want to move away from what they trust. They're often cynical about what we say about products. Yeah. So trying to get people to use new things is difficult, especially if it requires a different way to apply those products. So I think that there will be biocidal products available to the market for the next five years and more probably, no doubt about it. There will be a need for a change in terms of the type of products available. 
and these products won't be successful if we can't really get the yachting community to be open-minded that they're going to have to try these things so that they get worked with and used properly. Okay, thanks. Okay, can I uh, just make a conclusion that uh, perhaps uh, the different industries within the marine and the coating and other related industries need to work very closely with the marina operators? Because the marina operators are working on daily basis uh, with the with the boat you with the boater and the users, and I think that's one of the items I always uh, try to stress that that is very very important for the whole industry. Also, in within the discussions we have with the application of different uh, coatings, uh, do-it-yourself market, it is very important to have a close cooperation with the marina operators and industry. Can you agree? Absolutely. From a, from a coatings perspective, it's key. This, so we see pockets of local regulation preventing products from being used. So in Sweden and uh, seen in France as well, where individual marinas have issues with their environmental quality permitting for uh, concentrations of substances of water. So they have to change tax. So you see restrictions on polishing products, for example. So you can't sell um, highly tray fast polishing products into those marinas. You need either biocide free or hard systems that have low leach rate so that they can actually stay within their requirements on the environmental permit that they hold. So really engaging with the marinas and the boatyard operators to make sure that they're controlling their emissions and they work to choose the right products to work for their environments to minimize the input is really important. Um, and, and that scrutiny is going to continue under the Green Deal, I'm sure. Okay, thanks. Then, um, listening to, let's say, all the information you received uh, today, uh, what do you think is, the, let's say, in the new guidelines and possibility to have more interactions from the marina operators and uh, associations like uh, World Sailing? Yeah, I think um, there's some really good points raised and uh, there's going to be a focus certainly from, from us and our uh, national federations on disseminating, uh, I think, some improved uh, best practice because I think what's happened in the past is that whilst best practice has been created, it's really just been given to government agencies who um, might not necessarily have the best um, or easy uh, to relate that to, to the boaters. Um, so I think that's where our, our federations come in. And just picking up on the point about collaboration with marinas, um, through the um, Global Marina Institute, um, I teach a bit on that and we, we started to integrate lots of the um, awareness around biosecurity um, and other environmental aspects of marina management. So it's certainly on the agenda um, and I think it's just it's just going to grow over the next couple of years. And um, the Globe Fouling project is a good way of bringing all the interested parties together. OK, thank you. Julian, just uh, looking, let's say, at uh, developments uh, international and seeing that, let's say, Europe, especially the European legislation is uh, increasing is more strict than uh, even more strict than in other parts of the world what do you think what will be the effect on let's say the future developments in relation to anti foulings also with the discussions we had the last uh, let's say six months with the european commission can you just give a personal yeah. view Sure. I mean, of course, um, you know, the, the new chemical strategy for sustainability published a couple of weeks ago, part of the EU Green Deal is, is, a, is in the mind of all companies when they're, they're looking forward to, uh, to, uh, to develop products. So, yeah, legislation in the EU is the leading legislation in terms of drive towards a, a greener environment than, than anywhere else in, in the world. But also, we also have some strong regulations in, uh, in, in parts of the United States, too, where they've been through this discussion on anti fouling before in the state of Washington, the state of California. And what we've ended up is, is really with, with what we're saying now. We, we've ended up with biocidal anti fouling having a role because we recognize that there's not one silver bullet that can do everything. But then we're seeing other, other technologies creeping in and, and working together with, with the Cotex companies going forward. So, so I'd, I, 
I see the sort of drive towards uh, the Green Deal is driving change in the industry and it will drive us towards more, um, you know, lower impact products, definitely. But I would say, you know, let's not overlook the biocidal products and the role they have. Uh, you can actually design a biocidal product with a very low environmental impact. Yes, it releases a bit of biocide, but that biocide will be dissipated, degraded, and have no impact or no toxic effects. So it's not a, it's not creating a toxic, contributing to a toxic environment. It's actually created part, part of overall when you think about the benefits that biocidal antifouling can, can actually contribute to uh, improving biodiversity across the world. So I think we need, we need to have to think all the time outside just one bubble of a regulation let's think about across the environment and drive drive the the industry will drive towards better products which not just improve water quality but also improve biodiversity and prevent air pollution and, and are safe as well thanks um Darren, if you're listening to let's say to all the stories uh, and the experience within the chemical industry do you expect to have uh, the same for your devices and this, the industry you are representing? So I think, I mean, if you look at it, we've, we've taught chemistry, then there's the marine biology, and I suppose uh, ultrasonics is the physics. So we're doing the full science lesson today, aren't we? And, 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 and we, know the, we know the physics works. We know it is. The, the biggest issue, I think, my particular side, if you just specifically look at ultrasonics, is and the lack of regulation around it in that you could somebody could bring a, an ultrasonics device to the market tomorrow and some people are um that frankly don't work and and, and are, there are some great product out there um but how does the consumer know what's great and what's not there's no consumer protection around it there's no regulation around it and and it, you know um as a business person i hate the idea of regulation but on this occasion it's the wild west and we need to make sure that the the good actors in this uh, in this environment um, are able to succeed and, 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 and the consumer does not get ripped off because like I say, you can do a box and claim that it's ultrasonics, bang it out there and how that, there's just no way the consumer know at the moment because there's, 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 no, there's no grading, there's no regulation. So we do need to deal with that um, on one side and that, that will actually then help people like the coatings companies and the marinas and whatever also embrace and work with uh, the technologies such as ultrasonics. But we can't have this Wild West situation, that's got to end. Okay, thanks. Um, but is, um, in, in your, uh, let's say for you all, the opinion to have an independent forum with all kinds of data and all kinds of experience. Because uh, if I listen very carefully to everybody, of course, there are a lot of experience with anti a lot of experience with coatings in combination with, uh, there are a lot of experience with um, uh, foil. Uh, so, Yes, but what what you are saying in, in general, um, and also what the team is saying here, is we need, in fact, um, an education of the user, an education how to behave, uh, how to use it, and what, what kind of um, um, data are available. Is that, uh, let's say, um, maybe to all of you, um, um, a forum possible within IMO or and similar institute. So, so if you look at the um, the GIA uh, task force for glow fouling, we've just done our two first bits of work stream. Are uh, in in many respects educational. They are bringing together all the data on um, drag and fuel efficiency by having clean hull, clean propeller, clean different parts of your vessel, um, into to have one defined hit hit. You know, do do. I speak to people and I say, how, how much benefit do you get efficiency wise from a clean propeller? And most people will say two, three, 4%. Well, when you look at the science that's come out of uh, Korea now and, and out of Strathclyde University in particular, the real hard studies, medium fouling causes a 30% inefficiency on your propeller. Now people don't know this because there's too much data out there. So the IMO through the globe filing, we're looking to see, can we bring that data together to have one hard set of statistics? Then we can educate people on the benefits. And we're also trying to bring together some sort of matrix to understand all the various amounts of um, regulation out there. So, so people can understand, and then we can start bringing together. And there are other areas where I think the IMO can almost act as this repository of this is the data because 
The problem, we live in the Google world. You can Google it and get 97 numbers for the same question, and we can't have that any longer. Was, uh, let's say, when I attended the last meeting, when the last uh, physical meeting was for um, within uh, IMO on cloud fouling, there was a big discussion going on whether, let's say, uh, the guidelines for recreational craft can become a mandatory, yes or no. According to IMO, there was no, uh, let's say, uh, convention applicable to my opinion if you look at the un convention uh, you, the un convention on biodiversity it is applicable should we go in that direction as well to have a more international uh, mandatory approach just a short reaction from sh 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 shall i give you an initial reaction albert yeah i think getting things done at imo in terms of new approaches takes a long time okay and so if you're going to try and uh, make things mandatory in, in regulation for, for anti-fouling or fouling control, uh, you really need to pick an existing convention to amend rather than have a completely new convention. New convention, 10 years, 15 years. There is a convention on anti-fouling. It's the International IMO AFS Convention, Anti-Fouling Systems Convention, which really at the moment just bans nasty substances. So it's banned TBT and now it's about to ban Ergorol or the Servitrine. So it may be with some clever amendment and some clever lawyers, you could actually design into the AFS convention mandatory part to, 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 to control biofouling in a more effective way and make the AFS convention do more than just ban hazardous substances. That would be my suggestion. Okay. Dan, what's your opinion? I think, uh, first of all, it would be very, very difficult to implement just because of the, the sheer variety of recreational craft, how they're used, if they're on trailers, if they're not, where they're stored, where they're going. Um, so I think that landscape would have to be really, um, as Julian mentioned, that's, this is why these things take sort of 10 to 15 years. Um, but I don't think we'd be completely against any legislation. It would just have to be implemented in, in a way that was uh, obviously manageable um, by, by different member states. So it'll be interesting to see how that develops. But I think in the first instance, um, sharing best practice and education is, uh, is the way to go. Okay. Garrett? And I agree with everything said so far. Uh, for me, it's a policy challenge. So if you, it's crucial to look at the scale of the problem problem you're addressing so the, the the international side of things the global stuff is very important however we know for a fact now that pleasure craft are moving non-indigenous species around within Europe so I think the first point to address is to figure out how you get individual member states within Europe to behave in a consistent way from one place to the next and how we come up with a framework to prioritize preventing non-indigenous species being moved around in a way that actually highlights and recommends the ways that you can control them. Because at the moment we don't have that. Julian's touched on the AFS is a negative list. You will not use these things. The BPR is a little bit like that as well. It's creating a, um, a set of negative lists. You can't use these, but it's beginning to say you can use these things, but the framework limits what we can do with the technology available. So until there's someone that steps forward and says, this is a policy framework that prioritizes these solutions to get this benefit at this cost in this other area, this is going to be really difficult. And then mapping that into individual countries one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one will be a big challenge. I'm hopeful that the Green Deal actually can lead us down that direction because it recognizes the need to have joined up policy across the whole of the chemical framework, but also highlighting the need for better control on the biodiversity aspects as well. So if we're going to achieve it, I think it'll be on a regional basis, so Europe region, and it will probably come through Green Deal decisions. It will highlight the need for much better collaboration across the policy areas. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I'm sorry, it's we don't have an hour like uh, we used to be with the physical meetings. At least we have a little bit more. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for your input and uh, hopefully uh, the Y is able to uh, conduct a uh, very nice uh, video so we can see it on the, the 10th of December. And, um, and hopefully we all can join again with the questions from the public.
thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for all your input. <laughs>